Hi guys, welcome back to another Fraser Virtual Museum video. My name is Melinda, I'm a teaching artist and historical interpreter, and today I'm gonna to share the story of Madame Glover. Madame Glover was actually born Annie Casey, and she moved to Louisville in the 1870s as an Irish immigrant. Unfortunately, when she was young, her father had passed away, and so she needed a way to help her family make some money. And luckily, she was an incredibly talented seamstress. At the turn of the century, department stores lined what's now 4th Street. And so this was the first time you could actually go in to maybe like a hard goods store or buy whatever you needed and also get tailored for a new outfit. And this is what Annie did. So I'm here in the Southern Exposition Gallery and this was really important because it was basically like the World's Fair except it was held here in Kentucky. She had gone to work for a department store called the Sharp and Middleton New York store that had a gallery at the Southern Exposition. And in it, they featured all of the textiles that they wanted to show off, things like uh, silks and satins and um, international items, even exotic things like leopard skin rugs. And so it's no wonder that Annie had all of this access to incredible items that helped shape her creativity. She had gained a reputation in town of being the best dressmaker at any department store. She was making what are called trousseaus, and at the time, young women would spend years and years on their trousseaus. It was like a bridal wardrobe, which contained enough uh, attire and new outfits to last a married woman about a year at the furthest. Annie had the clever idea to hand make all the pieces a woman would need in her trousseau and just sell it as a bundle, and it would take about three to four months for her to make. And before long, she was making more trousseaus than anybody else in town, and young women were scrambling to get their hands on a Madame Glover trousseau. So later, she finally got enough money to open her own studio. Her studio ran for about 20 years, and she had an incredibly prolific career. She had opened in 1891, which was two years after Singer released their electric sewing machines for the industrial market. So she was able to deck out her studio in state-of-the-art technology, and just to give you an example of some of the things that she was making, let's take a closer look at the artifacts. We have them under low light. This is of course to help preserve the integrity of the fabric that you see. Um, this is a black silk evening dress. Um, and you can see just the gorgeous lace work up close. Um, all of that would have been hand applied and each seamstress in her studio would have had their own skill set. So there would have been a couple of women dedicated to lace alone. And up here you can see just how high the collar goes. Um, and a dress would have taken about seven weeks to make from start to finish. That uh, includes when the customer came in for a fitting, um, Madame Glover would drape the fabric first. Um, usually a cotton material called muslin, and that would become the lining of the gown. Um, later, apprentice girls, uh, who started at about 13 or 14 years old, would baste stitch, meaning they'd uh, put a stitch in that wasn't really permanent. You could easily take it out in case they messed up. But that would hold the draping in place so that when it was removed from the form, uh, the fabric, the actual fabric, the expensive stuff, would be cut from the model and the senior seamstresses would be the ones to finish out the dress. So I'm gonna move to another one. Um, this was a, a day or a tea dress from about 1900, 1901. And you can see the collar up top um, and just how gorgeous all of that handiwork really is. And this was really the first time that um, Society was moving so quickly that fashions were changing every single season instead of every single year. So it was really important if you were uh, in upper class society to show that you were in um, the right colors, the right textiles, um, the right sleeves, the right collars, and um, all of this would be made for you. Now around 1900 to 1904, a dress like this one would have cost uh, between 100 and $150 in Gilded Age money. Um, and that's almost $1,500 in today's money in 2020. So you can see just how much money people were spending on one outfit alone. Here is the back of that evening, that gorgeous evening dress. And just the layers on this are really stunning. Madame Glover was the first, one of the first designers to take telephone or telegraph orders. 
uh, meaning you could actually telephone in uh, and a seamstress would answer in the studio and you would give her your measurements and uh, refer to a page number in the most recent issue of whatever fashion catalog you had on hand. That would be something like Harper's Bazaar or Ladies Pictorial. And you could say, I would like the dress on page five, but I want it in XYZ color, whatever custom arrangements you make with the seamstress. And then later, about three months from then, it would be sent out on the rail car. So even if you lived in Chicago, San Francisco, or even overseas in England, for example, you could order your very own Madame Glover dress. So for our activity today, I have in front of me some embroidery hoops. And this is something really easy that you can learn at home. Uh, I am not an expert, but there are plenty of videos online where you can teach yourself exactly how to do this uh, with different techniques from beginner to expert. So uh, today I'm gonna teach you how to make a French knot. This here is um, an embroidery hoop that museum guests helped me with last summer. So you can see um, all of the flowers, leaves, and rosettes, for example. These are pretty easy to do. Um, and then lastly, these little dots here are the French knots that we're about to do. By the way, you can see how messy this is underneath. It does not matter what yours looks like. <laughs> as long as you're okay with messing up a few times, this is very cheap material. So I'm just going to um, take my needle and place it up, maybe just try to estimate where I want this knot to go. And now I've pulled it as taut as it can go. So I'm going to just take a very small section here towards the base of the fabric. And I'm gonna place my needle at kind of a horizontal angle, but I'm gonna twist around twice. I'm gonna go one, two, and once I've done two full rotations, I'm gonna stick it back into the fabric. Now remember, don't stick it right where you pulled it up through, otherwise your knot will come undone. But mine is pretty much right next to where the thread is already coming out. I don't know if you can see that. But I'm gonna gently and very slowly pull through, making sure that my knot doesn't tie sooner than I want it to. So you can see I'm going very, very slow. And there we are, there's my French knot. And you can use whatever colors you like, uh, and you can even freeform your designs like I did on some of these leaves and guests have helped me out too. So I hope you have fun, let me know if you try this at home and we'll see you next time.